Tolkien is renowned for not turning down any role he's offered. I guess this is why he appears in such rubbish as The Country Bears, or America's Sweethearts. Of course, his real career low point has to be the 1991 movie McBain, directed by James Glickenhaus. Did somebody say James Glickenhaus? Who the hell are you? I'm the cinema snob. Who the fuck are you? I I'm Film Brain. Film Brain? Oh, real cute. What are you, 12? Aren't you supposed to be in school? What are you, my dad? Touché. If you lived in the 80s, and I did, unlike this fetus, then you probably watched a lot of action schlock. And one of the biggest creators of this schlock was Glickenhaus, creator of films like The Exterminator, The Soldier, and Shakedown. Oh, Blue Jean copies it was known internationally. This is my intro. Would you do me the courtesy of shutting the fuck up? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? McBain is the first of three films Glickenhaus made in the 90s, where he fell into swift decline. Now, you must be wondering, does this have any relationship to the Simpsons character? Randos! Ah! Do you want me to finish off? Because it sounds like you have so much wisdom to impart. Well, don't mind if I do. Alas, no, it doesn't share similarities with the character, but it did cause the Simpsons producers trouble because they couldn't use the name for a bit. Hence, they started using Rainer Wolfcastle as the actor who played McBain in the Simpsons universe. Fortunately for the producers of the Simpsons, the movie fell into obscurity quickly. So quickly, in fact, that it's quite hard to find. The only release, to my knowledge, is some no-name distributor called Boulevard Entertainment, who can't even be bothered to spell the word Columbia correctly. Alright, shut up. We gotta get to this review at some point. Wait, if you can't stand me, why are you reviewing this with me? Because I like being an asshole. Go figure! The movie opens in Vietnam in 1973. Listen to this theme, which really gets me in the mood for action. I guess this is the Vietnam era music you get when you can't afford to use Paint It Black, Fortunate Son, White Rabbit, or Sloop John B. It also sounds like the music you get when you can't afford Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> I'll bet you don't even know who these people are. Uh, I've heard of their names. <laughs> I'm too old for this shit. We see a group of people being told the war is over and to go home. And it seems this movie was also aware of the amazing technique of making your actors look 18 years younger by smearing mud over their face. The I guess he doesn't read the paper. Ha ha ha! That guy tried to kill us! Do you see it? It's a bamboo doll! What do you want to do? I want to check it out! But the war's over! It's up to you guys! Yeah, I mean, it's not like you've been ordered to go home. Oh, wait. They decide to land the chopper and investigate the POW camp, where we first meet the titular McBain, played by Walken. Last time we saw Walken in Vietnam, it was in The Deer Hunter. Oddly enough, this movie makes me want to shoot myself. And this looks like a stunningly realistic depiction. The camp is covered with human skulls, and one of the Vietnamese has a necklace made out of human ears. I hear he's compensating for something, eh? I can't tell if this is Vietnam or Cannibal Holocaust. Either way, I'm not going to be surprised if someone gets their dick cut off with a sharp rock. They've also apparently built themselves a Thunderdome. This fight looks a little too cheap to be called Thunderdome. Heat Lightning Dome seems more appropriate. So McBain fights with what appears to be Vietnamese Rambo, who I can assure you has nothing on the Turkish one. Maybe I'm misremembering my history classes, but I don't remember the Vietnamese having caged death matches. But soon the American soldiers arrive and shoot up the place. I swear this looks like a movie in a movie from the Tropic Thunder movie. I mean, the black dude acts exactly like Kirk Lazarus. I know who I am! I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude! Santo shoots Vietnamese Rambo, saving McBain's life. They make a promise tearing up a hundred dollar bill. If the other half of this bill ever finds you, you can pay me back. This guy must have money to burn if he can tear up a $100 bill over a promise he made to a guy he just met. We moved to Colombia in 1991. How old were you in 1991, Film Brain? Couple of months to a year? 
Man, you're making me feel old. We see Santos and his village rebels, including his sister Christina, played by Maria Conchita Alonso. Oh yeah, the girl from The Running Man in Predator 2. She seemed to disappear after this movie. Whatever happened to her? Who gives a fuck? Santos is about to lead a revolution against the president of Colombia. What will we do if you don't come back? If you ever need help. I mean, really need it. And I'm not here. I want you to look up an iron worker by the name of Bobby McBain in New York. I've only met him once as a captured POW, but I have complete faith in his fighting abilities that I've never seen. They sneak into the presidential compound by hiding in a limo with two prostitutes. All this is making me think about is how much better a prostitute would be than this movie. Also, this has to be the most ill-prepared revolution ever. Just seven people. Gee, I wonder if this is going to go well. They take over during El Presidente's speech and Santos makes a plea to America for assistance. The US presence is informed. It's possible, Mr. President, that a CIA agent, uh, totally without authority, may have led them to believe that we would help you guys are fucking with the wrong president. Whoa, this president's a badass! You may laugh, but you just fucked with the wrong president was the get off my plane of the early 90s. But there's nothing the US president can do but sit back and watch. Back in Colombia, the president's men start taking hostages. So Santos takes El Presidente outside and hands him his gun? Fuck it, I'll just let McBain handle it. And speaking of McBain, we see him watching the news in a bar. The footage we are about to show you is extremely graphic, and viewer discretion is advised. Holy shit, they never show anything like that on TV! If you break it down, Glickenhaus is just borrowing elements from his earlier movie, The Exterminator. Both are about two guys in Nam. one saves the other's life, they remain friends, one is murdered years later, and the other takes revenge. They just replaced a gang of street toughs with Idi Amin. So Christina makes the long trek to America, and once again, check out that soundtrack. This is my song for freedom. This is my song against terror and fear. We are the power, we are the people. I think I'm gonna throw up. Excuse me. Ugh. Uh. She arrives in New York and finds McBain on top of the Brooklyn Bridge. Christopher Walken is apparently doomed to repair suspension bridges for the rest of his life after appearing as Max Zorn in A View to a Kill. <coughs> you pussbag. She tells him about the situation in Colombia. They gave the peasants coca leaves to chew on. Everybody was stoned, everybody was happy. So they... They stopped planting food. All they wanted was coca. And the people lost the interest. They grew thin. They ignored their children. Wow, Walken looks so bored. He's clearly waiting for that paycheck to arrive. So how does McBain respond to this sub story? When I was about 17, I went to this famous concert. It stuck. You were there at Woodstock, weren't you? How fucking old do you think I am? I got there, I had no food, shelter, just music. For three days I sat in the rain, smoked dope, I was happy. When I got back to the city I read about it in the newspaper. One reporter said he found a dark side to it. 500,000 people sitting in the mud, stoned, three days, not minding. At the time, I thought, what a fool, he just doesn't get it. Looking back 25 years, I think maybe he did. Oh yeah, because spending your days in a country filled with drugs, poverty, and dictatorship is totally equivalent to spending three days stoned off your ass. McBain starts calling up his old Vietnam buddies who are all unhappy with their jobs. He comes flying through the bathroom door with his ass on fire. If it's not too much trouble, I could use a stat. Why bother? This one's dead. His heart's still beating. He isn't dead yet. Look at the brain scope. He's a flatliner. Why don't you call it? We can use the parts. Wow. Annie Potts is a bitch. McBain goes to see Michael Ironside, who has become a rich drug runner, but he turns them down initially. 
I wonder if Christopher Walken and Michael Ironside duked it out to see who got to play the villain. Of course, if that happened, no one would have been left alive, so to be safe than sorry, neither is the villain. From out here, it's hard to see what's wrong with that city. Yeah, but you still live in one of the best countries in the world because you have the right to do something about it. You know, that's all my people want. Look! The Statue of Liberty's in the background! Symbolism! The hell was that? That's sort of like my catchphrase. Yeah, it's a catchphrase because it's fucking stupid. Stick with real catchphrases. Thank you very much. McBain takes Christine to the airport and goes home, and his buddies are staying with him. Who won? Gil did. He passed out after the 35th beer, but Gil was still able to talk. If you drink 35 beers and you're not dead or in a coma from alcohol poisoning, then God clearly loves you. They decide to get the money for their operation by taking it from some drug dealers. Easily the best death scene in the movie. I agree. He owned that motherfucker. What the fuck do you want? Money. Oh, I get it. Dealers of death. Hey, man, you expect them to work in Burger King making three seventy-five an hour? I pay them two hundred dollars a day. You know, they're just trying to make a living. Do I look like the kind of guy that could get a job in one of those glass towers? Is that Louis Guzman? Yep. Did he just make a confused political statement after we blew away six or seven drug dealers? Yep. Does this movie have any clue what its political message is meant to be? Nope. So McBain leaves that poor, hard-working drug dealer alone and goes after New York's biggest crime boss. And how do they do this? By pretending to be Israeli Mossad agents. Compared to the people I work with, you're not much. You recall Munich. We tracked down and killed everyone responsible, including their family, for three generations. Even the Iranians don't fuck with us. You mean that you work for... <laughs> hey, some of my best friends are Jews. I got nothing against you guys. That's why we're here. You see, this is our annual fundraising drive, and we would like you to contribute $10 million. This is the most offensive thing I've ever seen. I've seen worse. And so, just four guys managed to scam money from New York's biggest mafioso. And it works! Who knew? And then to capitalize this, they steer the plane, completely blowing up a control tower implausibly made out of wood. Elsewhere, Christina rallied up, holy shit! Santos didn't need McBain, he just needed her! She rallied up more men than he did! Michael Ironside decides he wants to come, and thanks to his plot device, he provides them with a map. So they prepare to fly to Colombia. When was the uh, last time you flew one of these things, huh? Ah, Dalton, I'm not joking. Don't worry. It's like riding a bike. Some things you don't forget. How long? 18 years. Luckily, it takes far less than 18 years to forget that you saw McBain. As they fly into Colombian airspace, they start to be tracked by jets who want to bring them down. McBain to base. Under attack by commie Nazis. Charlie 704, put the plane back. Holy crap, did you see that? He shot the pilot with a tiny pistol without breaking a single window. Because he's Christopher Walken. He's fucking awesome. This guy is unfucking believable And then the jet crashes in bad stock footage. Unbeknownst to Walken, that plane has landed on the very people he was trying to save. Two more jets arrive, but some pilot friend of Ironside takes care of them. All of the damn fighter jet action is about as exciting as watching someone play Sonic Fury on the Action Max. The fighter then takes out the men on the airfield, which Christina has been fighting. It's a good thing they didn't take out any of the rebel fighters in those massive fireballs. So the plane lands and the pilot joins them and they unload the arms off the cargo plane. They proceed to take a group photograph. Also, it's clear McBain doesn't know what a wide-angle lens is. Either that or he's intentionally trying to crop his friends out of the photo, leaving only him and the hot chick. Given that it's a movie about an ensemble group of soldiers, it's interesting that they got the title from one character. That'd be like if instead of calling the show the A-Team, they simply called it Faceman. 
Speaking of the A-Team, that's pretty much what this movie is. It's the A-Team if every character in it was George Pappard. Even the black guy! El Presidente tortures a general charged with guarding the airfield when two men with suits walk in. Apparently, they're the ones really in charge of the country. And how do we know they're evil? They throw the guy out the window! Ceiling fan and all! Well, you gotta give this movie points for inventiveness. And you know how else we know they're evil? One's called Hans! Ah, uh, God bless foreign xenophobia. And as if they weren't cartoonish supervillains enough, the pair sends the peasants a message by blowing them up with helicopters, laughing and hollering as they do. The team arrives, and it turns out a girl needs their help. Well, what's the matter, man? What is it? Her rib cage is crushed into her lung. She's in shock. Well, can you do anything for her? Can you help her? I'd have to cut her and reinflate the lung. So? This place is filthy. She'd die from infection alone. Let's just do it. Like the old days. But after a little on-the-spot surgery with a pen knife and a pen tube, she's fine. Ribs crushed into her lungs? That's treatable. Christina takes over a TV station to give a message to the people. A few years ago, we used to have free elections. Now a Presidente lives in a palace and the drug lords own 80% of the farmer's land in our country. Our children chew coca, and their eyes glaze over. Like ours are doing right now. This results in a citywide power outage, which I can only assume is actually because race stance kicked the power line again. The people take to the streets, and McBain and the pilot ride towards the compound with a petrol tanker armed with a bomb. But a wheel gets popped, so the pilot sacrifices his life, blowing up the gates. He's the only main good guy to die in this movie. And he wasn't even part of the main team! The people rush into the compound, into a waiting hail of gunfire. At the rate they're being picked off, Columbia will be lucky to have a populace. Even better, why the Sentry suddenly decides he sides with the rebels. Nice epiphany, but I would have had that before I shot about 100 people. McBain's Vietnam buddies arrive on the scene and start gunning down some soldiers. And now for something completely different. Effective immediately, I have ordered the Treasury of the United States to begin printing a new form of U.S. currency. This new money will be exactly the same as the old money, except that instead of being green, it will be printed on red, white, and blue paper. The fuck does this have to do with anything? I think it's part of the film's half-baked political message. Half-baked because that's what James Glickenhaus was when he wrote this shit. Elsewhere, the evil suit guys get captured, and that's it. They don't even get a graphic death scene! These characters were completely pointless! And speaking of lame conclusions, McBain walks through the palace, jumps through the ceiling, and shoots El Presidente. He doesn't even get a one-liner! What a boring ending! And so Christina flies in, takes control of the country, roll credits. This thing is only a hundred minutes long, and I think if it went on any longer, the only thing we'd witness is Michael Ironside betraying them. Why, thank you for reviewing this with me. It's been like looking into an older, fatter mirror. <laughs> and it's been like talking to a younger, retarded cousin. I'm Matthew Buck, beating down bad movies everywhere. And I'm the cinema snob. Snobbing. Bad movies everywhere. You don't have a sign off, do you? No. This is my song for freedom. This is my song against terror and fear. We are the power. We are the... Did you ever notice how men always leave the toilet seat up? That's the joke. You suck, McBain! My eyes, the goggles do nothing! <laughs>